in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, scripture says. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. I think I should read that again. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, or woman, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, the whole of life, the fact that you're alive and living, is actually seed time, planting time, seed time. And in one sense, it's not just seed time, but it's also harvest. So you would get, you would get um, whatever you've been sowing coming up during your life. And of course, according to this text, there would also be a harvest at the end of the age. So you'd have both now, what's going on, and then later on. So life as we know it is actually seed time. It's the Lord, and the Lord set it up like that. And so whatever it is that we sow, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a sense that you would reap it. That's a fact. Um, and obviously, from this text, we would realize that we need to be sowing right. That's the, question, that's the thing we're dealing with. So our life, on one hand, while we're uh, sowing seed, uh, our life is also like a furrow, like a, 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 a hole that somebody would dig to plant. Uh, it is an open furrow to accept seed. Whatever, whatever experiences or whatever other, um, other people sow into your life is going to be part of it. So you would accept seed. So um, every moment, every time we, we're, uh, we live, every, every moment we live, we meet the harvest in time. Can I move to this one? Check again. Here we go. Sorry. Yeah. So, and then God, of course, governs his universe by this principle of sowing and reaping. He started that right at the very beginning. He said, let there be uh, trees and the, or seed-bearing trees. And, and then he set in motion a whole um, a universe on this premise that is of sowing and reaping. Now, we don't want to go into all the details of that, but what we want to do is deal with this context of this text that we read, which is found in the book of Galatians. Uh, in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, uh, we, we, we read about two guys. Scripture talks about them like this. The old guy, the old man, and the new man. The old man, and it's important for you to understand this because Otherwise, you'll find you're stuck. The old man is the one in Adam, you, a man outside of Christ. And that man, as you have lived, and my, I have lived our lives, we've been sowing. And we've been sowing to the flesh, to the carnal man, to, the, uh, to, that, to that Adamic nature, a sinful nature. And then over the years, we've reaped that which we have sown that you can't get away from. But then we came to the Lord. And so Jesus, the scripture talks about him as the new man. And all of us that are in him have received a whole new life. And we receive mainly the spirit of God. And now he is living that life through us. And so we now have a choice in us 
they exist both with Adamic nature, that is the sinful nature, but also we have in us the divine nature. And there are people that believe we don't have that Adamic nature, it's all over, it's been crucified. Yeah, it's been crucified, but this life is not yet over. What happens to us is that we're going to be raised from, our, from the dead. Sin has been dealt with, the power of sin has been broken, obviously, but sin still remains. And we now have a choice, that is the big word for us this morning, the choice to either sow to that nature or, or, or sow to the nature of God living in us. Very important, that one. And so if you continue to sow to the, to the sinful nature, the scripture says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he will reap. For he who sows to the flesh, that is that sinful nature, will of that nature receive and reap corruption. Even as a Christian, you have a, you have a choice to live. Are you going to live that way? If you live that way, then obviously you're sowing Stuff that will produce in time uh, corruption, ruin, chaos. But if you sow to the spirit in that which God has done in your life, then obviously you will reap accordingly life and blessings. See? Now, sometimes in the church you will want to live in this place and think, well, that's the way it is. No, life is not that easy. So we have to figure out how we're going to conduct our lives. And it's very, very important. We are very actively involved. So Paul, in this book, addresses salvation, salvation that is by grace. Uh, you know, you didn't, even, you didn't even know that you're going to get saved, but God did. God called you at a certain time, and then you receive his life by faith. You receive that, and you be born again. It's just like you being born naturally in the world. You had nothing to do with it. Right? But your parents did. And some people, of course, the parents say, I made a mistake. <laughs> um, but, but you're not a mistake, regardless of whatever they said. The Lord has orchestrated all of this. So you're born, but it was not of your choice. And so to being born from above, it's not a choice that you've made according to, uh, but the scripture says, but according to the will of God. So, now, so you have a choice. And so this, this nature, this, when I point to my left, it's that sinful nature. This nature has its own uh, fruit or works. And this nature, the divine nature, has its own fruit. So let's, let's look at that for a second. And then we'll go on. In Galatians 5, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, he is encouraging us to do that. Let us also walk in the Spirit. If, if we didn't have two natures, the, this, this text is all cockeyed. It shouldn't have been there, right? We have these things going on in us. In us. And that which God dealt with is still in us. But it's, it doesn't have the same power it used to have before. Before, I didn't think too much about how I lived. And I didn't think of, you know, that this is a lie. I didn't think that, you know, uh, this is wrong. I didn't have all of those boundaries in my own life. I had major boundaries, you know, don't murder people and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, all those little things that we let, let we allow, those kinds of things, we didn't think about it. We just got our system uh, rebooted in that way constantly, and we lived a certain way. But now that we've come to the Lord, we have yet another system, if you like, in us, and we have to make a choice how we're going to live. So now we're talking about the agriculture of the spirit. So the flesh, our carnal minds, our carnal nature, has its own fruit. Look at it, verse 19. 
This is the old guy. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. I, again, you'll see these things, in the, and Christians don't do these things. Right? Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Christians don't do that. Contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, that's factions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you before, I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that clear or what? So, now, you have to make a decision. So, you have, you have two natures. The one is actually dying and is wonderfully dormant if we let it be dormant. And you reckon yourself alive unto God through Christ and your soul to the spirit. This thing, you don't feed it. But, but, but those thoughts come. If, you, if you've had those devils before, those things will constantly be coming as a temptation, as an attack on your mind. Wanting you to process that thinking, process it. You see, your body can't operate without the seat of thought, which is your mind. Hmm? Can't work. So the thoughts will have to come out, and, and the thoughts are like outsourced to the body, to the body do this. And it pretty soon, if you continue to outsource it, give it away to the body, say, do this thing, you'll do it without thinking, just as we used to do. Like today, we will drive, you don't think, ah, oh, put your clutch in, take it off, hey, everything, you know, no, you don't, you don't think of it. You know, you just drive. But when you are driving, you see the learner drivers, the L's, the L sign in the back, you'll find they travel very slowly, they're very careful, they're all over the place sometimes. Shame. They're, they're learning. They're learning. They have to think about it. And sometimes when they have to clutch or declutch, they have to look down. And the, dive, the fellow says, hey, hey, don't look down. Look at the road. Look, look at the road. Hey, where you look? Look on the road, you know. And it's constant. You have to think about it. It's like learning a language. Same thing. You have to think about it. But pretty soon, you start talking to other people. You know, you've got your license. Everything's sorted. You're driving with one hand now. You know, sometimes there's no hands, ma, see, no teeth. You know, whatever. You, you know, you just live, you know, without thinking. And, you know, even then, one could make accidents, you know, because we become careless. So, too, in the area of our living life, we have, be, we have to be very, very careful. So, those things that are of darkness, of the old guy, the old man, will constantly be rearing its head. It's not outside, by the way. Hmm? It's inside. Inside each one of us. So the thoughts to do such things come from within you. So you have to be thinking, really thinking seriously about that. So putting it all together briefly, we can say that our minds, the seat of our will and our thinking, the thoughts where choices are made is where the real business of sin happens there, mind, thoughts. And, uh, and you have to think about it. And you have to say something to that thing. You have to say, like Jesus said, when the thought came in, you have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Especially if you've had issues in those areas before. And you can read that list of works again. And your, our category must be there somewhere. And you have to say to yourself, no, I don't want to live like that. I am not going to live like that. I'm going to live like this. This is what I'm going to do. And so, choices 
are where the sin resides. That's where it is. So think about it. It's not so, so serious. That's where it is. So these thoughts, as I said earlier, are farmed out or outsourced to the body. And without thinking, this body begins to do it. Eventually, we don't think too much about it. So Paul, what he's saying here is that we must say no to the dictates of that sinful nature. We must say no. Why? Because in Christ, we have become dead to that. Imagine a dead person trying to resurrect something else that you used to do. I'm always, I, I smile sometimes when people talk to the dead, you know, in a funeral. They really, some stories, they, they speak to that person who's dead who doesn't know what's going on at all, right? But I know, what, I know what's going on. People are really broken and so on. But so this thing is supposed to be dead, crucified, put away. And now you have a whole new life. So our context the sowing and reaping could go either way. We must choose, basically. The sowing to the flesh produces corruption, while the sowing to the spirit produces life. And then Paul, of course, develops the story early in the book. And so it's only five chapters, one, six chapters. You could read it, like you, I gave you Jonah last week. I think you read it at home this week, most of you. Hmm? Yeah, I can see that. And this week you can read Galatians. Read a little bit carefully. So, now, my family... Parents, my family that is, um, did a fair, fair amount of farming, a fair bit of farming. One time we had a 28-acre farm in Amkumas, and um, we had pineapples and, yeah, on those hills, and planted beans and whatnot, and the, on the plains, right next to the river. Kumas River. It's quite an amazing life. Now, it would really surprise my dad if he planted peas and carrots came up. Hmm? That would be bad. Now, this is also true in our own lives. If you plant peas, you're going to get peas. If you plant all of these other works, you are going to get it coming to you in a harvest. It's a principle with God. Though even now as Christians, you have to deal with that stuff. If that comes up, remember, if if you walk there, you're going to meet that harvest in, in your lifetime somewhere. So in this text, in this context in Roman, I mean Galatians 6, there are three areas I want to deal with quickly. And, and the three areas that we're going to deal with has to do with the Galatians 6 mainly. First off, he says, sow good seed into yourself. Let good seed come in. Allow the seeds of the Spirit into your life. Because we, at the end of the day, we will receive life and harvest life. So look at this text in, in Galatians 5 verse 14. It says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I tell you, love and loving your, your neighbor as yourself is the, one of the top commandments. One, love God first off, but love your neighbor as yourself. It's something that we, if we did, we don't have to worry about anything else in the whole world, by the way. Because any of the works, if you, it'll be knocked off if you just have love for that person. I won't go and sin with a person because I see them as God's, you know, object of love. I'd be caring for that person. Make sure that I don't mess up with that person. And also, I won't want to mess up myself because I love myself. I don't want to allow anything to happen to me. I want to sow right. So, but in the very next verse you read, Paul talks about how we must love. Now, this is where it gets down to the practical side of things. In Galatians 5, verse 15, that was 14, 15. But, he says, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I don't know if you read that before. What does it mean? I always like to ask the text. What, is it, what do you mean? Biting and devouring one another, implied here is gossip. Yeah. 
If I am gossiping about you, then I'm actually biting you, eating you. You know, you talk about eating people for breakfast. It usually happens at lunchtime. They go home today, you'll talk about me. Mm. Gossip and arguments and just plain meanness. You know, be mean. Now, eating one another, that's what I'm, I'm seeing in this text. If you eat one another, you eat one another until the other is no more. And if I keep devouring pieces of you, there won't be a you pretty soon. And if you eat me, pieces of me, there won't be a me pretty soon. Do you see that? Hmm. I can see that going down very well. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. That's what it's saying. Be consumed by one another. You, there won't be a thing. And this is what goes on in the world, man. This is the flesh and corruption that goes on there. Eating one another until the other one is no more. You know, people can really be broken by words. You don't even have to use a gun or a dagger. If you want to put people like this, use words. That's why even WhatsApp has a problem, you know, you're going to block that person, block that person. When we were little, we had other phone that really, you know, we want to cut somebody off, we just bang the phone, you know, bah! you feel, you feel, you feel like you've shut somebody down. Now you can't even do that. You feel this pain if you hit that phone. You can't throw the cell phone. The only thing, the other thing you can do, block them. Don't talk. Hey, you, you're not going to talk to me no more. Right? You all don't do that. Christians don't that thing. Now, what you know, yeah, hurt words can hurt badly, very badly. And uh, so you gotta watch this. You gotta watch it. Because when you are doing this stuff, you're gossiping or whatever it is you do, you're biting one another. Remember you're sowing. You're sowing. And guess what? It's gonna come to you. Because that's what you're sowing. Hmm. this sowing to the flesh produces a harvest and so where we allow the works to be um, to happen we flesh it out by biting and carrying on no I think we must go rather pray about that person and pray that the blessings of the Lord upon that person because God loves people remember last week you talked about Jonah he loves those people that guy, the prophet, he didn't like the Ninevites. He wanted them dead. Imagine that. The prophet. But God wanted them saved. Horror of horrors that your enemy, you know, God wants to bless them. He wants to make it, make it good and, you know, really that they would grow up and grow in and grow out in every way. So this, this produces a harvest either way. One of ruin, decay, corruption, or the other side of life. So, God is saying, sow good seed into yourself. Very, very important. Sow good seed. Don't allow those seeds to, to uh, produce a negative harvest. Secondly, I see here in this text that we must watch out for others. We must sow into others. Yeah. Look at this one in verse number 1 of Galatians 6. That's where the context of 7 and 8 is found. In Galatians 6, it says, brethren, sister and included, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, or NIV says fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, if people, people sin, and now everybody does something stupid some, from time to time. But sometimes some people do it deliberately. They, they, are, they premeditate. It's a premeditated crime or sin. They think about it, as I said, the thoughts. Keep coming, keep coming. You think, well, I can do this, I can do this. I can, you know, I, I can live my life now differently. The world constantly gives us stuff like that. 
you know, you don't have to stay with this person. This person is like this. You know, this is nonsense. That person don't deal with it. You know, it doesn't deal right. They're not right. You know, if you lived with this person, that person was going to do it right. This is the story, blah, blah, blah. Leave that, go there, leave that, go there, leave that, go there. And pretty soon, something happens. The premeditated. But sometimes, it's not premeditated. It just suddenly happens, you know. Something happened, and not as hectic as that, but you're overtaken a fault. And the scripture says, the scripture says that if you see your brother overtaken, overtaken, I look at the word overtaken, like, you know, yeah, you are driving at your normal speed, hmm? and somebody's overtaking you, like the sin overtakes you, and catches you, corners you, like hijacks you, stops you, takes the gun now, AK-47, And then you are taken by that thing, whatever that is. Now, Scripture says that everybody else that is spiritual shouldn't be pointing fingers. If you're spiritual, our job is to sow into others, is to restore such a one. Restore, bring them back to that place where they were. Restore them. How? How? Not in a spirit of condemnation, but in a spirit of humility, of love. Spirit of humility, meekness, gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, because, because that can happen to you as well. What's going to happen then when something happens to you, how are you going to react? How are you going to get right? How are you going to get well? You would need somebody to come alongside, sit with you, and say, now, what happened, man? Hmm? How can I help? What's happened? And our job is not to go tell the prayer meeting now. So-and-so went like this, went like that. Because some people don't have news of their own. Hmm? They like to tell the news that they just heard. It makes them look good, like they're like a journalist, you know, of some repute. They've arrived, they're working for the, you know, Sunday Times, the Vineyard Sunday Times or something like that. You know, you tell the story, you heard. Hmm? Now, when you do that, you are sowing into your own self. Hmm. Scripture says, if you know a brother or sister is overtaken, then you must restore them in a spirit of meekness, humility, considering yourself. Why? Because you don't think that you are strong because you can fall. All of us. Because sometime at the speed that you drive, the devil decides, I want to drive faster and catch him. And I've, I've, I've known over the years that if the devil can't take you down and out, He'll take you up and out. Hmm. I don't know what's going on behind the mask, but I tell you, I have issues with that mask. So, Paul goes on to say then, our role in, in the body here in verse number two, it says not only must we heal people who've been overtaken, but it says we must bear one another's burdens, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each shall bear his own load. What is he saying? You know, the burdens are like the packs. You got a pack in your, your backpack. You carry, everybody carries it. In the old days, they say, kupa. Hmm? Burden, trouble. And some people call it a very big pack. Then he is high as the mountain. And they're bent over trying to carry it. Or it might even bent over like this, trying to carry the load. And they come to us, they come to the church, they come to be with us and enjoy the Lord. And our job as the church is to sow into them. That's what we've been giving ourselves for decades. 
is to bear the burdens of others to carry their pack help carry their pack lighten their load because people are very very burdened and imagine if people like that come in you did nothing to bring them in but the spirit of the lord is drawing them in making them part of the body of christ and then they come into a fellowship where there's biting and devouring and all of that going on imagine what happens to that soul that's why the lord set it up in his in his universe if we sow to the flesh we will receive corruption so that sometimes you think you know you know we talk about warfare some of the things we are called to fight we fight ordinary fights actually spiritual fight and we can fight ordinarily we don't need to get into a you know I'll fast and pray for 21 days in order for me to get victory i'll tell you what you stop this nonsense you'll find a lot of devils leaving hello you know where the devils reside they reside in the works of the flesh that's where they are that's where the darkness is they're where the sin is they're not where the spirit is they're not in that nature but they're in this thing so every time you catch yourself going off then you can you can bet that you're losing ground to the devil that's who you're losing ground to and then you try to cast him out of your circumstance and your trouble nothing works your prayers don't work because the devil says you're mine hmm. so we have to be very careful that we watch these simple things and i'm talking about the simple things man this is ordinary stuff i think hectic about this in fact galatians were written to be read as a book not to one church but quite a few churches and i'm expounding on it taking one few verses expounding on it helping us understand but it's simple stuff so watch out for others so into them not carnally but spiritually farm into them farm them into the things of the spirit that's what we call to do everybody's got some issue if you want to really look if you look at this white wall you know if you don't really look there's a black spot here and a black spot there there's dark things there things are chipping there hey, any place you look you look in your own life you'll have flaws either your nose is too big you know your head is too big head is too small eyes are too big lips are too big or not really you know facebook special lips you know you know all of that you just just we got issues we're not too tall we're not too short we you know we're like too fat you know too rounded too hey man hey, man, hey. we all have that that's only the physical side imagine spiritually you you can't say we are all well rounded in the spirit we got issues right so if i want to really pick up dirt on you i can i'm not talking about anything in particular i'm just talking from this text but i don't have an issue i don't want mad about something i'm not this deal with this thing i think is very very normal for us to have issues and but we need to work this out watch watching for others watching out for others so into yourself so into others then lastly what he says in this particular context is so into into the ministry look at verse number 6 let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches both the hearer and the teacher need to be blessed in every way so let him who teaches if he is blessed then he needs to share his good things with the those that are teaching do not be deceived that's where it is found huh right inside there god is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life and then he goes on to say let us not grow weary while doing good doing good taking care of your brother helping your sister you know helping them along find out what's going on why is it happening like that you know some people from time to time lose their jobs they they do and you you have to ask so so how are you managing i ask that question so how are you living man what's happening are you managing you you eating 
and they would, uh, if there have been people that have lived, you know, for the Lord, they would usually say, well, I tell you, God is so good. Huh? Even when times are bad, it's okay. Hmm. Let us not grow weary doing good. Then therefore, we, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of God. And I have all that to say this when I'm going to close. A few minutes. A story. Two, two guys, Jacob and Joseph. Jacob was the father, Joseph the son. You know the stories. If you look at this man's life, Jacob, he, he sowed initially in his life, he definitely sowed to the flesh. You remember how he went and took the birthright and being a pretender, going there and taking the birthright and pretending to be his brother and he took the uh, double portion. You remember that? And, they, and Esau finally said, you know what, this fellow is rightly named Jacob because Jacob meant cheat. And guess what? Whatever he sowed in his life, cheating, deceiving, then he sowed that into his life and that was sown into his life. If you read it, when he was thrown out of his house and he was, went, he was gone from his father for what, 20 years, long time, to be separated from your home, your family, and his brother and father and others. And he went away to go join his uncle, and the uncle robbed him of his, of his wages so many times. He was deceived by his uncle. See, this thing about sowing follows you, follows you. And yet, it was, God was with him, you know. God gave him a covenant before he went uh, to Laban, the uncle. But yet, that which he had sown followed him. It's a principle with the Lord. So how do we change? I used to get frustrated with that. Lord, I've been sowing badly in my life. I was talking about my life and Adam. I said, how am I going to change that? He says, you can't. What you can do now is to so right. Because when those weeds and other things come up, this would have already grown to become a beautiful garden in your life and will overpower that other thing. So you're going to start. Somewhere you're going to start. If you start giving yourself away, your body away, and you, you know, all of that, your, your, your birthright, you give away, you sow. You sow. Spiritually, you sow into your life and your own history or your destiny. So Jacob was like that. He spent many years in much sorrow and pain. You read the account. A lot of the Old Testament, especially Genesis, deals with him. This negative harvest, that's what he had. Continued until, until one day his encounter with the Lord. He was on his way back home from his uncle. Took all the, um, his wealthy, he was a wealthy guy. Also, by that time, and a few wives, that's another story, we'll read it, Days of Our Life there. And then he goes back. But then he hears his brother coming to see him. He cheated his brother of his inheritance. And he was coming with 400 men. And he was worried about that. He thought, this guy is going to kill him. Who knows? But that night, he went before the Lord, crying out to God. Asking God for deliverance. He separated the families and one wife went with some people this side, another went this way. And then he sent gifts of animals to the brother. But he wrestled with God. Scripture says early in the morning, an angel came wrestling with him. Didn't want to let him go. Finally, the angel smote him and put his leg out of joint. Long story. And then he walked with a limp, you know, from that moment. And the Israelites don't eat that part of the, of the animal because of that. But that day, his name was changed. The scripture says, God changed his name. You're no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. Israel. Prince with God. You prevailed with God and have won. There is that an encounter. See, you can sow these things in your life, but there must be the encounter with the Lord that can change the harvest, change the farm. No matter what the devil has been doing in your life, and you've, 
it's not too, it's too late to solve that problem, but it's not too late to get this thing changed. Your destiny changed. And with God. And so that moment, that day, everything changed. His perspective and also his brother. When his brother came, his brother was very, very good to him. Again, we have a name change too. We're no longer in Adam anymore, but we're in Christ. Amen? We have the spirit. We belong. And Jesus is our elder brother. And we're part of him. And we have a whole new deal. The spirit of the Lord now in us. We cannot allow, we cannot allow us to go back to that, those dead, dead things and beggarly elements. But this guy, Joseph, his, bro, his son, Joseph. You know, Joseph, this boy, was badly treated in Jacob's house. This was after the encounter that Jacob had coming back home. He was badly treated by his brothers. But somehow, unlike his dad, he had a very different disposition. He, even though he was hated, he loved and kept his eyes on the Lord. Even though he was hated, he loved his brothers. And he kept his eye on the Lord. He didn't allow this, this bitterness to creep in and to, and to sow discontent and pain and cause a different kind of harvest. The scripture says, after every few lines, when you talk about Jacob, uh, Joseph, every few lines, you read this line, this rephrase. And it says, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. I tell you, no matter what your brothers, family, bosses, whoever does whatever they want to do to you, cheated you out of things, you've got to keep sweet. Hmm? Keep sweet. It's very, very important for you to keep sweet. And because of that, the spirit of the Lord was on him. And later on, he was reconciled with his brothers and so on. And he became like the prime minister of Egypt. He was sold as a slave there. Then he was falsely accused by this woman. See, he never gave into the woman's lust. Never walked away from it. I don't want to sow that kind of rubbish. No, I can't. Hey, you belong to your husband, my boss. No, no. Yeah, yeah, you're a good looker. That I know that part, but no. And he ran away. Hats off to the guy because he didn't want to sow that stuff. Had he sown that stuff, he would have blown it. Do you understand this? The harvest would have been very different. But because of his, his, his uh, sowing and sowing to the spirit, he found life. He was put in prison because the lady lied. She says, no, he, hey, this is Hebrew fellow you brought here. He came here and he wanted, you know, yeah, he, he, wanted, he wanted to be with me, you know. Yeah, I thought this was working for you. Put him in prison for that. I don't know how long he was there in prison, but he was there, he was there quite a bit, a few years. For nothing. Falsely accused. All oh, the plan of the Lord. And he never retaliated, never said a word, never spoke against that woman, and never said to the man, you, you don't know who you got. He could have said it. He could have. He could have even blamed God. He says, God, you know, you know, I'm here, in this case, my brothers put me here, you know. What's going on? He might have been fasting and praying too. To change his circumstance. But the Lord wanted to know if he's going to sow right. Because his destiny was going to be beautiful. And because of his ministry in prison, even though it was bad, things were bad, the dreams that got him into trouble first off but with his brothers, he still dreamt. And now he interpreted those dreams. And that catapulted him. He continued ministering to people in prison, even though he was, they were sad. And he, of course, was hurting big time. But he never showed it. He sowed to the spirit. 
and then eventually he was given the opportunity to be the prime minister of Egypt. I ask you young people to change your destiny. Change it. You don't have to go that route. Change it. Serve the Lord. Walk with God. That Hollywood and whoever is speaking, even Bollywood nowadays, speaking a very different language, trying to get us to live a very different life. Watch it. Watch the education, the training. Because we have a very different life in Christ. This guy had many occasions, as I said, to sin and allow sin to fester. But everywhere you read, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. So what can I say to Jacob's credit, Jacob, his father? See, this is the thing. Yeah, he messed up. But if Jacob had not allowed the dealings of God into his life that day, then I don't think Joseph would have turned out like he did. See, could have been bad. But Jacob turned it around for his children. He did that day when he found the Lord and met the Lord. You're young now. You might not have children yet, or you might have children that are really small. You can turn it around for them. You don't have to live that way. Remember, I don't think uh, even Joseph would have felt the father's love, Jacob's love. Remember how Jacob sewed a coat of many colors for Joseph? And because of that too, he was hated by his brothers. Father loved him. I don't think he could have even loved like that without that encounter with the Lord. He would have been just a guy that was absent in the house. Fathers in the main are absent. They sow their own seed and they have had their own harvest going. And they have had for a long time. Now they have raised up a whole family. But you can turn this around. It pays to sow to the spirit. Life on earth is, is life in the making. It's seed time. It involves a series of choices. Let's, let's make this good. What do you say? Let's make this good. Let's remember also, there's not only the harvest now, but there's ultimately a harvest on that day. We might get away from here, but on that day, the Lord will show us. And I hope that we won't be found wanting when we get there that day. Amen? All right. Will you stand with me then? Let's bow before the Lord. This is, this is a, a holy moment. It is a sacred moment. Lives are in the balance. Your life is in the balance. You could, you could, you could this morning say, well, that's it. Samuel, I'm, I'm, I'm making a recommitment to the Lord. Here I am. Here I am. And you say that to the Lord. Lord, I'm here. I belong to you. I'm sorry about this, that, you or the other. As Jacob of old, this time that we have right now, right here, may be okay, but it's not enough. I'm saying to you, I would go home and in this week, wrestle with the Lord. Yes, wrestle. Wrestling has to do with close combat. And you wrestle with the Lord about your issues, your life. You know what? We carry the packs. Our bag pack might be full of stuff. We might not be aware of the weight that we got. So let's give it to the Lord. Spirit of the Lord, thank you here this morning for your work. 
which you will continue and then continue this week and the days ahead of us. Lord, I pray as we yield ourselves, I ask that you would come, that you would come, Lord. Come. We need you, Lord. We need you. We are broken about the seed, the bad seed that we planted in our own lives. We're not excited about the harvest that we have received. We ask that you'll have mercy upon us. That this moment would be that moment where things are changed. Lord, come visit us. Just think about your own life. Think about what's going on with you right now. And ultimately, we will meet the Lord and answer that day. But today is a day also of harvesting. And the Spirit of the Lord wants us to sow to the Spirit and to that new man that God is creating you to, to be. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, each one. And you know that we're not perfect, that we need you so much. So come. Free us. I come against every work of the enemy. You know, you can't pray against the enemy if you still have some of that thing in you. So you're going to have to let it go. Let it go. Yeah, you're going to have to let it go in order for you to pray effectively because your war will be over if you yield to the Lord. Yielding to the Lord and saying to the Lord, okay? Yeah, it's been hard, but I know here am I, Lord. I give in. I give in. I yield. Spirit of God. Lord, I pray that you bring freedom here this morning. Freedom. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom, Lord.